My name is Christian Hernandez. I'm a venture capitalist. My job, my passion, is to fund technology and innovation that will drive disruption and economic value. A couple of years ago, I was at Oxford University giving a speech. And a lady, a journalist at the back of the stage, raised her hand and asked me a question. She said, "If your job is to fund disruption, whose job is it actually to fund the jobs you're disrupting?" It's a question that's actually sat with me ever since. And the deeper I go into the advances in technology around artificial intelligence, robotics, and genomics, the more I really start thinking that we need to start asking that question and defining an answer. But not only talking about the jobs that are being lost, but actually the impact that those technologies are going to have on our society, our economy, and even our humanity. The Industrial Revolution was transformational. It changed our definition of urban centers. It changed our population growth, and it even has some negative impacts on our planet. We know that in hindsight. Over the next decades, the acceleration of artificial intelligence, robotics, and genomics will change our planet and our humanity as well. We know that looking forward. What we might not know is how quickly or how deeply those changes will happen. And so we're sitting on this cusp, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity in humanity to actually proactively think and debate and discuss and act upon some of the changes that will happen to us. And yet I fear that too few of us actually understand what's happening, too few of us are actually having the conversation, and too few of us are actually acting upon it. We need to start talking about morals and ethics when we talk about technology. You might want to know why would we want to discuss something as fluffy and soft as morals or ethics when we're talking about technology? Well, the truth is, technology has no morals. Morals are placed upon technology by its creators and by its users. As futurist Gerd Lenhard recently wrote in his book *Technology vs. Humanity*. The fundamental challenge will be that while technology knows no ethics, norms, or beliefs, the effective functioning of every human and every society is predicated upon them. These are the frameworks upon which our societies are built. And we, as technologists, corpor corporations, governments, and societies. Are pursuing these amazing advances in technologies without necessarily thinking about the moral and ethical overlay we're placing upon them. And as a technologist, a citizen, a father, and a human, that concerns me. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the nuclear bomb, famously said, "Knowledge cannot be pursued without morality." And I fear that we are. So let me share some examples of some amazing advances in technology. And yet, how not necessarily overlaying a moral layer on top of it might lead us down the wrong path. We're living in an era of data and algorithms. The advance in artificial intelligence will drive amazing disruption. Today, an artificial intelligence algorithm can look at a million X-rays, and with that knowledge, identify that black spot in my own X-ray to diagnose or help a doctor diagnose me. Soon, artificial intelligence algorithms will help power self-driving cars, which will completely change our urban landscape, our notion of transportation, and even reduce the fatalities caused by car accidents. Today, artificial intelligence robots are actually making allocation decisions for investment from my retirement、uh, pot, therefore helping me be better off financially, but also have the money for my retirement that might be needed. And these are just going to continue to accelerate, but without actually thinking about adding moral layers, ethical layers to these algorithms, they could actually lead us to the wrong decisions and the wrong outcomes. As an example, in the United States,、um, the Justice Department created an algorithm that was meant to help judges make the determination whether to grant a prisoner parole or not, based on the likelihood that that prisoner might commit another crime in the future. The algorithm ingested vast amounts of data. And was meant to predict whether that individual versus another individual was a risk for society. The issue is that the algorithm was massively biased. 
An analysis by the organization called ProPublica proved that the algorithm would forecast with 77% more likelihood that a black prisoner was more risky to our society than any other. And the bias was built into the algorithm by its creators. The bias came from the data that the algorithm was using to make that prediction. The data included things such as, does the prisoner's parents ever go to jail? Does the prisoner live in an area with a high crime rate where they might be influenced to commit a new crime? And these data sets statistically influenced the algorithm to predict that blacks were more violent and risky to our society than others. I'm pretty sure the creators of the algorithm didn't mean for it to be biased, and they were trying to do something good by providing technology tools to judges to better protect our societies. But by not thinking about the morality of how their algorithm had been built, they biased it in such a way that I would consider reproachable. The morals of technology are created by its users. But they're also overlaid by us as consumers. In March of 2016, Microsoft Research released an experiment onto the wild. It was a chatbot called Tay. Tay was supposed to talk with users across messaging platforms, including Twitter, learn from you, learn about the language that you used, and try to have a human conversation. It sounded cute, and it was a way for Microsoft to show off its artificial intelligence research. But it very quickly went wrong. Users very quickly discovered that they could teach Tay to say things that we might never say to each other in a normal conversation. In 24 hours, Tay went from saying it loved humans to becoming racist and bigoted, defending Hitler and denying the Holocaust. And the PR department very quickly took it down, never to see the light of day again. And the problem with Tay was that it was a great lab experiment, and it was meant to do some pretty cool stuff, but its creators never provided Tay with the ethical framework for it to determine what might be appropriate in terms of social discourse, social conversation between normal people. And therefore, as users realized that that ethical framework was lacking, they started jokingly, or maybe seriously, trying to game it to turn it into something that we would not feel appropriate in a normal conversation. So the morals of technology can be impacted by the creators and the data, but also by the users and how it gets applied. Let's now turn from genomics, sorry, from artificial intelligence and talk about what I think is going to be one of the most disruptive technologies in the next 100 years, genomics and gene editing. Two labs in the United States have recently developed a technology called CRISPR, which allows you to very, very efficiently identify and at a very, very low cost, modified genes. Simplest way of thinking about CRISPR is the Microsoft Excel find and replace function. You give CRISPR a string of text, of DNA, and it swims across your body trying to find that specific string of DNA. And it has scissors, which cuts out that DNA, and it pastes a new, a new string into that space. In labs today, we're already seeing amazing amazing results from this technology. Scientists have been able to cure animals with liver disease using CRISPR. And very recently, a group of scientists announced that they'd been able to use it to identify and destroy the HIV virus. CRISPR is going to have an amazing impact on our health, our wellness, and our longevity. But I think it also comes with some moral dilemmas. The first of those is, who gets access to this amazing technology? Will it be purely a capitalistic decision? In other words, those who pay the most get the access to it? Or should it be democratized and given to all? It will have a transformational effect on humanity, and therefore, how broadly do we want to benefit, this benefit to spread? The second issue is how else it can be applied. What if you start using this technology to modify the eyes and the hair color of your unborn child? Could I pay for a DNA treatment that gives me my hair back? Or could it actually be applied to make soldiers 100 times stronger or actually make their, their DNA not susceptible to biological weapons? And this is where it actually starts evolving into 
how does gene editing and gene modification start to influence how we believe is the proper use of it, but also how we begin to influence what we define as humans. And in preparing for this talk, I, uh, I was going through this conversation with my nine-year-old son, Sebastian, and I said, I explained to him the notion of CRISPR and the notion of impacting and changing um, genes in humans, and he looked at me and said, but Dad, what is a human? Well, scientifically, being human means that we are part of a species, Homo sapiens, that happens to share the majority of its DNA with other Homo sapiens. Some of us have slight variations, black hair, blue eyes, blonde, darker skin, but in general, we're all fairly similar from a DNA structure. And that is what encapsulates humanity. But let me put that in context. Humans share 99.7% of their DNA with Neanderthals, or cousins who were wiped off the face of the Earth. That's pretty similar. And as we start modifying genes, and as we start actually changing our internal um, DNA, at which point do we cross that barrier from 0.1, 0.2, 0.3? And at which point do we go from humans to whatever comes next? And as we actually evolve into whatever comes next, how do we actually treat each other if we're cohabitating as two different species? Back to my earlier question about who decides who gets that treatment or that modification. But the modifications will not only be biological, it won't only be necessarily gene modifications. There's things like retinal implants that allow you to actually see 100 times better, or actually exoskeletons being tried out by the military that make you 100 times stronger. And if you're a Chinese military general, would you not want to have soldiers that are 100 times smarter, 100 times stronger? Or if you're hiring somebody to work in your factory, would you not want it to be 100 times more efficient, 100 times stronger? And we start thinking about how we'll make these decisions. Our framework of interaction at a geopolitical level is defined by this notion of human rights. But what happens when we have humans and something else cohabitating? Which rights will actually drive our interactions and who will protect who? And these are the types of conversations that I, need, I think we need to start having now. There's some initial efforts that are driving these conversations. For example, a number of uh, investors and founders in Silicon Valley have created the, the OpenAI, which is a non-for-profit organization seeking to di drive dialogue and frameworks for the moral application of artificial intelligence. Microsoft recently came out with a call for what it called the New Geneva Convention. The Geneva Convention is a set of rules that determine how nations at war treat civilian populations. But the notion of war has changed. It's no longer soldiers shooting guns and dropping bombs on each other. Now there's non-nation states attacking each other with cyber technology and biological warfare. And there's no legal framework for us to actually govern how we should be protected under that world. The World Economic Forum that famously meets in Davos every year and brings together government leaders, academics, and business leaders is trying to drive this conversation around what it calls the fourth industrial revolution trying to drive a conversation about the job losses, about jobs of the future, about artificial intelligence. And these are nice initial attempts to have the discussion. But I fear they're not enough, because they're missing one key component, and that's us. The billions of people that will be affected by this advanced in technology and for whom society, communities, countries, and even humanity is likely to change in decades to come. And the reason we're part, not part of the conversation is because the average person in this room, average person in this world, does not really understand what's happening. Right? We might have read a, a news story in Jakarta or Sao Paulo about robots taking our jobs, or seen some TV special about gene cloning and mice being copied in labs. But it still sounds very science fiction and very far away. And I'd argue it's not that far away. Governments play a role in this as well. Governments should be driving the discussion. Governments should be thinking about how it applies to their citizens. But most recently, the U.S. Secretary of Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, said that he did not really get bothered much by the changes in AI and robotics because it was 50 or 100 years away when they would actually start displacing jobs. With all due respect, sir, I actually think it's going to happen much more quickly and much more deeply. And even if it is only 50 years away, that starts impacting children that are being born today. So I really think you should care about it today. There's also a role for media to play in this, where the media should be educating rather than scaring us. 
helping us understand these amazing advances in technology, but also helping to drive the discussion around what each individual society thinks are the right moral decisions or ethical layers on top of its application. We need to start becoming part of the conversation. And so I'll leave you with a final thought. Go educate yourself on these amazing advances. Go read about them, go be amazed by them. But start having your own internal conversation about how it might impact you, your job, your community, your children, your country, your humanity. And after you have that internal conversation, question how you morally or ethically feel about them. And then go have that conversation with your neighbor. And then have the conversation with your kids. And then have the conversation with your boss and your elected officials. These advances are going to accelerate extremely quickly. And we have this one-in-a-lifetime opportunity in humanity to proactively figure out where we lead our communities, or societies, or countries, and our race. Technology has no morals. The users and the creators of technology lay those morals upon them. I think we need to start having the conversation about what sort of future we want and what morality we want to overlay on top of it. Thank you very much.